Right, so um, while we're waiting, I typically say several introductory words about the center, how great we are, how much uh, things we do. Uh, here, I will say just briefly that we organize these events, the Friday forecasting talks. We still have several of them to go. And uh, today we have uh, Hui Jin Chen, who will present on new taxonomy of vector ETS models. And if you're interested in uh, learning more about our events, then there is a landing page. I will add the link to the chat so that you can visit it and select the talks as you're interested in. And yeah, well, over to you. Okay, good. All right, hello everyone. I'm very pleased to be here. Apologies again for being slightly late. Um, so I'm going to share with you uh, our current paper on a new taxonomy of vector exponential smoothing and its application to seasonal time series. Um, as you can see, this is co-authored uh, with Ivan and John, both from uh, Lancaster University, while I am based at the University of Portsmouth. Um, this current paper is under uh, revision at the moment, but I'm hoping that it will be published soon, so hopefully that you will read it in the near future. So the plan for the next half an hour or so is that I will start with uh, the motivation behind this research, mainly coming from uh, practical needs, and then I will talk through our theoretical development um, in this paper. Uh, very briefly on simulations, um, but then a little bit more time on the empirical analysis, which we did on the M5 data from a Walmart. Um, and then finally, I'll draw some conclusions um, and then some ideas pointed towards uh, further research. Okay, so starting with uh, research motivation, so mainly, as I said, from practical needs uh, of organizations, uh, finding that it's really difficult to estimate seasonality in the retail context uh, accurately, mainly because nowadays um, data histories tend to be very short. As we all know, markets are moving at faster paces, product life cycles are getting shorter, new products are being launched onto the market all the time. Um, so if you're lucky, you get two to three years of data. Um, so that's only a few complete seasonal cycles. And that's if um, uh, data points are recorded accurately without missing data. Uh, but still, that's not a lot to go on in order to understand and estimate that seasonal behavior um, accurately. And also, uh, organizations are not just forecasting a few uh, items, uh, they usually have multiple products, can become quite a big number, um, which is challenging on its own, but uh, these products usually are sitting in natural product families, branded groups, and so on. So it is reasonable to assume that these products actually share very similar uh, seasonal patterns. So if you think of um, clothing items, you know, they have different colors, they have uh, different patterns, different sizes, but essentially it's the same product and it's safe to assume that these products have very similar uh, seasonal patterns. And also we have products being moved around and stored in different locations, so uh, it's easy to you know, access various markets. Then again, there is an argument that if we can tap into uh, that data, which then enables us to explore cross-sectional information from similar items, um, effectively then increasing uh, the sample size to help us uh, dealing with estimation uh, of the seasonal patterns. So there is some empirical evidence in the literature going all the way back to uh, Dalhart 1974, with the come 1989, uh, they proposed two different versions of uh, estimating seasonality from the group rather than individually. Uh, they calculated uh, fixed seasonal uh, indices. And then Bunn and Vasilopoulos, 1993, did an empirical 
comparison. So looking at Dao Hot and Wibicom's versions of the group approach and compare them against the conventional individual way of uh, estimating seasonality uh, univariately. And they found that the group approach uh, performed better than the individual. And then my earlier work with John uh, in 2008, we also did an, an empirical analysis uh, looking at these different uh, approaches and our find findings were consistent with Van and Vassilopoulos 1993, but we also developed uh, a selection rule uh, from another paper and we applied that selection rule in this uh, empirical piece of work. So the idea is that instead of applying universally the same approach to all items within a group, you can be selective, you can apply different approaches to different time series. And it turned out that selection rule worked even better than universal application of group seasonal indices methods. So that's just a bit of a uh, practical background uh, why uh, we uh, started this research. So moving on to what we actually proposed in this paper uh, is a taxonomy based on parameters, initial values and components. So we call that PIC taxonomy. So the idea is very much again about, you know, looking at things either individually or commonly from within a group. So various people have looked at um, some aspects uh, of these elements. So for example, in terms of um, smoothing parameters, Fields et al. 1998 uh, applied common smoothing parameters for level and trend and found that improved forecasting performance. Overhand et al. 2007 then focused on seasonality. So they applied common seasonal smoothing parameters. Now, theoretically speaking, if there's a damp trend in the model, damping parameters can also uh, be applied commonly from a group. Um, but to the best of our knowledge, we haven't found any previous studies actually looking at comparing individual versus uh, common damping parameters. Uh, Initial values and components, again, Uvahan et Atel uh, looked at common seasonal initial values and a common seasonal components in their 2007 paper. Now, Uvahan et Atel 2007 is quite central to what we're doing here, so I'll return uh, to that a little bit later on. So we claim that in our current paper, our original contribution is a systematic way of looking at this PIC taxonomy, uh, parameters, initial values, and components together. Although our motivation uh, stems from uh, estimation of seasonality, this taxonomy is not restricted just to seasonal demand. It, you can see it actually applies to level and trend as well. And we apply that comprehensively and assess its effectiveness through simulation studies and also uh, assessed with real data, as you will see later on. Um, so how do we apply this uh, PIC taxonomy? So I will talk a little bit about the theoretical background now, which will then lead naturally to what we do in this paper. So going back to my earlier work with John uh, in 2007, that's the theoretical paper where we through stationary seasonality devised that uh, selection rule, trying to provide some uh, theoretical underpinnings for Bauhart and Wibicom's uh, group seasonal indices methods and try to understand under what conditions these group approach should be preferred to individual approach. And very much the concept is that um, we actually did this selection rule based on coefficient of distribution. Um, so noisy series, you know, those series uh, have quite high level of variation, uh, quite difficult to uh, estimate uh, forecast on its own, can borrow strength from less noisy, well-behaved series, uh, while those well-behaved series do not want to borrow weakness from the noisy series. So that's what we did in that paper. 
Um, around the same time, Wolverhand et al, uh, 2007, uh, really was looking at the same problem, uh, but approaching it from evolving seasonality perspective. So they proposed a set of univariate ETS uh, MAM models. So some of you may be familiar with the uh, ETS uh, modeling framework. So that is a uh, multiplicative error additive um, trend and multiplicative uh, seasonal models. So you can see the, the standard equations there, but they modified that in the sense that they also believe the benefit in modeling seasonality as a common uh, component. So the last equation here is, so YIT is the demand, uh, L is level, B is trend and S is seasonality. So if you look at that last equation, so instead of SIT, so individual uh, at time T, they have ST. So that seasonal component is uh, modeled as a common component. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they also uh, looked at a common smoothing parameter for seasonality. So that's that gamma there. Uh, but another way of looking at it is that if you, so if you put that gamma inside a summation, uh, well, let's look at that term first. So summation i equals one to n, so assuming there are n uh, items um, in the group, um, then we have the wi terms epsilon i t, so epsilon i t is the, the noise term. Um, the way that they capture information from uh, different series across group is through that WI term. So it's a weight, basically. The, again, the basic concept is the same, that you know, noisy series can borrow strength from well-behaved series. So if that series is uh, noisy, then a lower weight is assigned to it, while well-behaved series is assigned to a higher weight. But if you put that gamma term inside that summation, so you have gamma multiplied by WI. So another way of looking at it is actually it's not a common smoothing parameter, it is individual. But um, anyway, just worth pointing that out. ETS MAM models are, are quite popular, uh, applied in both uh, uh, academics and uh, practitioners. Uh, but according to Akram et al. 2009, um, there are some undesirable features, um, especially in this context. Uh, in sales forecasting, we have a risk of having negative demand, uh, which can be quite problematic. In other cases, negative values are fine, but um, in this particular context for sales forecast, then we want to try to avoid that. Um, yeah, so we argue for a, a pure additive and multiplicative um, modeling framework. Um, we also want to apply the PIC taxonomy on multivariate framework rather than what Uberhan et al. did on a collection of um, univariate models so that we can model the interrelationships between series. Um, well, such models uh, do exist in the literature. Uh, for example, the vector innovation structural time series framework originally uh, proposed by the Silver et al. 2010. Uh, they proposed models with level and trend components. Um, this was then extended later by Athanasopoulos and the Silver 2012 to include uh, seasonality as well. Um, but in their framework, um, they only looked at um, additive models. Well, in our current paper, we consider both um, additive and multiplicative models. And in fact, we prefer the multiplicative models in that it is um, more natural to model seasonality as certain percentages up or down the base level rather than a fixed uh, amount especially when we apply the PIC taxonomy, when we think about commonality between uh, different series, then it's difficult to justify. They all have the same X amount. Um, 
for a particular season, especially if their base levels are quite different. While if we use multiplicative seasonality, we don't have that um, problem and the interpretation is uh, much easier. So uh, now let me introduce you to our proposed theoretical framework. So I have talked about the PIC uh, taxonomy and I have also talked about the need for a multivariate uh, modeling framework looking at additive and multiplicative models. So uh, now I present this uh, vector ETS star 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 PIC star 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 framework. So for the uh, vector ETS models, um, as I said, we don't look at all of them. We don't consider the mixed models for the reasons I've already uh, explained, uh, but rather we look at a subsection of uh, pure additive models and pure multiplicative models. For the pure additive models, you can see the letters are uh, the same as the univariate ETS uh, modeling framework. Well, for the pure multiplicative models, um, they're different. Uh, this is consistent with ACRAM et al. 2009, though. Uh, so this is more in line with how they define their multiplicative model. Um, so the multiplicative model uh, would assume a multivariate log normal distribution for the error term. Uh, so that ensures the positive values, um, but then we take a log transformation to make it uh, represented as um, additive format, which may be easier to read. And that's why we have that LN uh, denoted uh, at the end of those uh, brackets. Um, as for the PIC part, so the letters uh, are explained as follows. So for parameters, um, if it's N, it means there's no commonality. Everything is estimated individually. If it's L, then the level part um, is common. T, trend is common. S, seasonality is common. If there's a, a damping parameter, then if D is there, it means that that's estimated common as well. So you can have single letters, but you can also have uh, all sorts of different combinations of the letters. Now for initial values, then again, if it's N, then it's no commonality, um, but then you can have a level trend seasonality and the combinations of them. And the same goes for the components. So let me just give you a, a, a simple example, assuming two series in a group. So here we construct vector ETS model. So this is a, a multiplicative um, seasonal model uh, with the uh, damp trend. For the PIC part, uh, so you can see for parameters LTSD, meaning that all of the smoothing parameters are common and we also have common damping parameter. The middle part initial values, we have um, all of those initial values being common. And for the component, only the seasonal component is common. And this is uh, apparent from the last equation there. So again, uh, instead of have, having S1t and S2t, we have ST there. Uh, I hope it's clear. Um, I'll move on and look at another model. This is a, a simpler model, no trend, uh, but multiplicative uh, seasonality with different uh, PIC uh, variations. Uh, I mentioned this because this is the model that we applied in our simulation studies. So for each of the PIC elements, we could have N, so that's um, no commonality, or L, S and LS together. So a bit of simple maths, we can work out that. Uh, sorry, I don't know what's going on here. Let me just close that. Yeah, so you can see there are 64 possible variations just for one model here, uh, because of the different way that those PIC elements can be constrained, which is a lot to look at. Um, 
but some of these variations are not feasible, so they are not possible to construct, for example, PIC NNS. So you cannot have individual seasonal smoothing parameters and individual initial values going into that common uh, seasonal com uh, component. It's just not possible. While some others are feasible, uh, but not reasonable. By reasonable, we mean that we we find it difficult to find uh, applications for such constructions. For example, here PIC LS LS LS. Basically, everything is common. Um, in the retail context, we can't think of any examples where you know this is a good thing to look at. So, uh, removing these uh, will significantly reduce the number of uh, variations that we look at. Um, but I'll mention that uh, in, on the next slide. But the key difference between these uh, PIC variations is the number of parameters and initial values to estimate. And that's quite important because again, with short data history, it can make a big difference. Um, we have a general formula to work out that number K. Um, and the first term here, assuming we're looking at N uh, time series is the number of variables in that um, covariance matrix. Um, the second term here is the number of uh, parameters. So if uh, that particular parameter is not modeled, not included in the model, then it's zero. If it is common, then it's one. If it is individual, then it's N. And the third term here refers to the number of initial values for level and trend. And the last term is the number of initial values for seasonality. And M is the, the seasonal cycle. Um, so simulations, um, as I said, uh, we apply this one single model. Uh, we generate it in the uh, additive form and then take the exp function to make it uh, multiplicative. And by removing the variations that are either not feasible or not reasonable, then we were left with nine variations of the various PIC uh, constructions. It's still a lot to look at. And in fact, we did a lot of uh, analyses in the simulations. Um, but that's significantly reduced from the original 64. Um, the simulations, uh, the scripts were written and run uh, from the Legion package for R, which um, Ivan developed last year. And instead of showing you lots of tables, uh, I thought uh, I'll just give you some uh, key findings and insights from the simulations because then we can move on to the empirical analysis. So what we found from the simulations um, was that uh, it was the most beneficial to apply common smoothing parameters for all components. Um, so certainly it was beneficial for seasonality, but uh, it was beneficial for uh, applying common uh, smoothing parameters for level as well. And we also found that um, not all elements of the PIC may be beneficial. For example, common seasonal components part can become too restrictive. And this became very apparent in the simulation results, especially when the um, underlying data generating processes are very different, um, the, the performance were very poor. So uh, common seasonal components were not robust against model specification in that sense. Um, on the other hand, these two uh, variations work out very well and very robust. Um, so it is common smoothing parameters for both level and the seasonality. In terms of initial values, uh, can either have common initial seasonal values or individual. Um, they are not just robust in terms of the forecasting performance, both point forecast and prediction interval results are strongest with these two. 
All right, I'll then move on to the empirical part. So as I mentioned earlier, the empirical analysis was done with the M5 retail data uh, from Walmart, so it's in that retail setting. Um, we aggregated original data to the monthly level, uh, department store level, um, so that we get rid of lots of the zeros and we have fast moving data. So this means that we had uh, 70 products to look at with uh, 63 observations. And in terms of the data analysis, uh, we did, we experimented with two uh, sample sizes. Um, so we had the last 12 months as our holdout sample. Uh, to assess the performance uh, with the full data, then we, we used the rest uh, 51 observations for training. Um, but we also experimented with shorter data. So we had the same 12 months holdout periods, um, but we only used then the 24 uh, observations for training. So before we could apply our uh, VETS PIC taxonomy, we needed to put these uh, 70 products into groups and we need to decide on what um, vector ETS models to apply. So on the left-hand side in the graph, um, we did a univariate ETS model selection procedure. And then these are the, the models uh, selected. So most of them are seasonal, not surprisingly. Uh, only two of them are trended, so that's AAA and MMM. Uh, we looked at those two series uh, closely and the trend uh, patterns were very mild. So we decided to uh, keep them in the analysis, but treat them as um, non-trended. Uh, so this then means that uh, we had two broad groups, seasonal and non-seasonal. Um, and without the trend, it doesn't matter if you model seasonality as additive or multiplicative. But uh, as I already said, we have a strong preference for uh, multiplicative seasonality. So for the seasonal uh, products, then we applied the multiplicative um, seasonal model. And then for the non-season, also multiplicative model there. So on the right-hand side, you have the breakdown information on the number of groups and series. So we took the uh, original uh, categorization information from Walmart. Um, so we have seven groups of seasonal products, um, 57 series in total. And with the non-seasonal, we had five groups to start with, um, but one group had only one series in it, so that was not a group, and therefore it was um, removed. Um, so we were left with four groups, 12 series. Um, now, the findings. So I have two tables here. The first table shows you uh, the point for accuracy results. Uh, it is a lot to take in. So let me just um, take you through what we did here. So remember in terms of the sample size, we experimented with uh, the full data, so that's long and the short data with only 24 months. Um, models, we have quite a lot here. Uh, so taking on board suggestions from reviewers, uh, we used uh, univariate ETS uh, as our benchmark and also uh, experimented with different ways of um, having ETS models. So for example, the first one ETS LN, so that is uh, ETS applied on log transformed data. So it is consistent how we construct our own uh, multiplicative uh, models. The second one is ETS using the Adam function. Uh, from Smooth Package, the third one ETS uh, from uh, Forecast. So the idea is, you know, whether using different software packages will lead to very different results, basically. And then we have two versions of the, the vector uh, ETS models. So VETS-D means that we look at um, 
diagonal uh, covariance matrix, while that F is using that full likelihood. Uh, in the simulation studies, we've only looked at that D because of the uh, sizes of the groups and the history, length of the data history, it was not possible uh, to examine uh, that's F, but we thought it would be nice to include that uh, in the empirical part. Then we report uh, accuracy results. Uh, so you have these three blocks with overall results, uh, results for seasonal part, uh, seasonal data, and a non-seasonal. The measure we used here is a uh, relative mean absolute error uh, using the naive method as the base, and we summarize them using geometric mean and median. So what can we observe from the table here? Uh, so if we start from the short uh, sample size, short history, so the bottom half of the table, we can see that uh, VETS-D performs quite strongly here. Um, that's what jumps at you. That's both overall and for seasonal uh, as well. And for non-seasonal, it's performing quite well. So this highlights the benefit of accessing cross-sectional information, especially when uh, the data histories are short. So that, that is a quite clear message. And the VETS D performs better than VETS F. So there's an argument when you don't have enough um, data history, then uh, you have saving with VETS D, not looking at the full likelihood. But when we have more data uh, observations available, moving to the top half of the table, um, you can see that all of these uh, methods perform better compared with the short data history. Um, that can be expected, but again, uh, that D's performance is uh, quite strong there. Uh, now, let me show you the 95% prediction interval results. So here we report uh, coverage and the pinball uh, values. Uh, again, starting with the short. Uh, so if we look at coverage, uh, that's D gives us 97% um, uh, closest to the 95 um, percent nominal. And the univariate ETS models are quite far off from that 95%, and that is commonly observed uh, in practice. Um, but when we have longer data histories, again, you can see that those uh, univariate ETS models uh, catch on uh, with their coverage results. Um, but uh, uh, that's D again is giving us uh, the best results there. There seem to be some uh, trade-off between coverage and the pinball values. Um, in terms of practical implications of these results, um, because we're looking at aggregated data at the department store level. So if you think from uh, the department manager's point of view from Walmart, um, one area that these results can be applied is how to best allocate and reallocate store space and they need to do that on a regular basis um, to think about move certain space from one department and allocate it to another department. Um, maybe they need to do that three months ahead, six months ahead. Um, so the coverage results are quite uh, relevant uh, here uh, that, you know, it's not just about point forecast, but it's also about, about the coverage to give uh, managers uh, confidence and that certainty. Okay, so moving on to model selection. So I've shown that uh, with the empirical analysis, we did a, a univariate uh, ETS model selection with the VETS part, uh, but in terms of selecting the optimal restrictions on the PIC taxonomy, um, with trial and error and also insights coming from our simulation runs, it seemed that it was the most efficient to start with selecting initial states uh, restrictions, followed by parameters and then components. Um, so let me just show you the PIC restrictions selected from the M5 data. 
Now recall, we have seven groups uh, of seasonal products. So six of them selected LSSN. So this is consistent with what we found from simulations that common smoothing parameters for both level and seasonality, and then uh, common seasonal initial values are beneficial. So that's also the case here with the empirical data. Uh, one group selected uh, LSSS, so having that common seasonal component as well. And then for the four groups with um, non-seasonal data, two of them selected LLN, again, highlighting the benefit of having common smoothing parameter for level and common initial values one selected LNN and one selected NNN. Right, uh, conclusions. So in this paper, we proposed a new taxonomy. The idea, the concept behind it is very simple, very straightforward. So it's based on parameters, initial values and components and whether we estimate, estimate them individually or from a group. Um, we then applied this taxonomy to a group of vector ETS models. I think it's important to point out that we do not intend to fully extend the univariate ETS framework to a vector version, but rather we have selected a subset of purely uh, pure additive and multiplicative models to assess the PIC taxonomy on. So we do that through uh, looking at uh, simulated data and also real data from uh, Walmart. And I think we can safely say that we see uh, improvement in both point forecasts and prediction intervals. Um, we have devised a model selection mechanism um, for the PIC uh, taxonomy, and it has been implemented in the empirical analysis. So out of all of those PIC uh, restrictions, if you have to select a winner, if you like, then a PIC LSSN, so common smoothing parameters for level and seasonality, common uh, seasonal initial values and individual components uh, show overall very good performance, uh, strong forecasting performance and robustness as well. So where does that leave us uh, in terms of future research? Uh, the different ways that we can uh, look at. So for example, in our current paper, we take the, uh, the natural groups as given, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best way. So one potential further avenue is to look at grouping mechanisms, uh, maybe using some sort of clustering analysis to uh, put items into uh, homogeneous groups. Uh, another way is uh, having a proper model selection. So select both the, the vector ETS part and the PIC part. So one possible solution we've only just started thinking about is having an overall general uh, encompassing model that includes everything. Uh, and then if some of those features are not needed, for example, if the data uh, is not trended, then certain parts can be kicked out so that then we can put them into um, correct uh, models. Um, another way is that we could extend the current um, VETS PIC framework to allow multiple seasonal patterns. Uh, if we look at higher frequency data, and these are uh, commonly available nowadays. Uh, so that's, that's possible to do. Um, in the current paper, even the trend component is included 
in the framework. We haven't done any analysis either in the simulations or with the empirical data to assess it, how it interacts with uh, level and with seasonality. So potentially we could look into that when we extend the framework. Uh, another way is by looking at intermittent data as well, uh, given the interest that John and Ivan both have on intermittent data. And also the, the, the concept that, you know, with a lot of zeros, it's inherently very difficult to forecast. And therefore, uh, some of the things that we develop here may be relevant for that kind of data as well. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Hojin. Uh, once again, apologies for technical issues. Um, we, I, have, I have asked uh, Simon Spavound from PIC to provide some comments and a short discussion on this talk. Yep, so, thanks. Simon, over to yep. you. Thanks, Hojin, for a great uh, presentation and uh, staying calm, cool, and collected under <laughs> under fire there. Uh, well done. Um, I'm actually going to pass straight to the uh, the chat actually, because I thought there was some interesting question um, questions came up. Um, could you? I know you're not sharing anymore, but I think there were some questions around uh, the interpretation of the results, uh, particularly around. I'm guessing because on, on the table you had both relative RMSE and like the pinball coverages. So perhaps if you could give a brief description of of the of the interpretation. Right. Would it be better if I share the, the results again? Yes, please. If you um, don't mind. Okay, just bear with me. I need to find the slide. Uh, then share. Yeah, so it's this one, isn't it? Oops. Yep. Sorry. To the wrong one again. This one, yeah. So, sorry. What was the question? What are what are these numbers? Yeah. Basically, yes. What what do these numbers mean? Let's because yeah. so, they are different. I I understand, but maybe if you can. Uh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So if we look at the top table for the moment, uh, they are relative errors okay so um, they are relative mean absolute errors so in the sense that we assess for example ETS LN the top model against uh, the naive method okay so if the number is less than one then it means that this particular model performs better than the base model if it is more than one then it's worse and that's why the highlighted um, numbers so are the lowest values there. Does that make sense? So for example, here that's D uh, with the long data, the geometric mean here we have 0 0.894. So that's in comparison with that base uh, of naive method. And it turns out that that's D performs better than that. So uh, that's, a, that's a better result. And with the um, prediction interval results, um, the pinball values, uh, so we have pinball U, so that's the pinball, uh, the upper bound of the pinball value and the pinball L is the lower bound. Then again, these are relative values as well. So again, if it's less than one, then it's better, but the coverage results are different. Um, so we use 95%. So we want to see whether these models would give us the coverage as close as the 95 nominal. So again, here for the short, uh, that's the 97% is closest to that 95 compared to some of the others. Uh, while with the long, it's uh, 0 0.94. So we, we use uh, three decimal places just to show those uh, minute differences between these different models. Does that make sense? Yep, I think that was a great uh, explanation. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, there's quite a few more questions, so I'll just quickly whip through these. Um, someone's asking what the intuition is behind the commonality used in the model. 
Okay, can I see the question? Uh, Perhaps you can. What is the intuition behind the commonality? Okay, so yeah, so this is basically through uh, looking at what other people have done previously. Um, so with the ETS framework, basically, we look at, you know, smoothing parameters, we look at initial values, and we look at components. And remember, I talked quite a bit about uh, overhand at uh, 2007, and they only focused on uh, seasonality, but they looked at these three things. So it is quite natural for us to uh, think about modeling these uh, ETS uh, frameworks, you know, looking at whether we look at individually or commonly, and these things are mainly for, based on what other people have done, but looking at it in a more comprehensive way, and then beyond seasonality itself. Great, thank you. Sorry, I have loads of questions of my own. I just wanted to make sure all of the uh, of the audience's questions were asked. Uh, uh, this one I am interested in actually, which is from uh, Michelle, but it's, which is around the computational time. So, because this is something that often interests me, is the trade off between um, forecast improvement over additional computational complexity. So, if you could perhaps elaborate on the differences over standard exponential smoothing or ATS model, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it would depend on the number of parameters to estimate. Uh, with the empirical analysis, I don't think they had much difference between these different models, but uh, in terms of simulations, we had to run them on supercomputers just to save some time. So I cannot give you a definite answer how long it took. Um, but with simulations, we set up different scenarios and we run uh, 1000 replications. Um, so even with comparing, if you remember those nine different uh, variations, uh, going through a lot of loops, um, we sent them to the supercomputers. Uh, generally speaking, the results were completed after one or two days. So it, didn't take horrendous time uh, to calculate, but Ivan, maybe you can chip in here. Yes, I, I think I can provide some insights here. Uh, so I developed that function and it's available in the package called Legion. Um, on its own, it doesn't take too much time. Uh, it's on par with applying several exponential smoothing models to several time series. The main problem, the main challenge is in grouping, to be honest, from my perspective, because you need to understand uh, what series to include in that group. And, and then there is, as Hu Jing says, the second element, uh, which is you end up with potentially a lot of parameters. So if you have some restrictions, PAC restrictions, then the process is uh, faster than in the case when you don't have a lot of restrictions. So I hope it gives you an idea and yeah. Oh, thanks for that. I think as a, yeah, that's something for me that's becoming increasingly important when looking at these kind of methodologies of, you know, there's a trade-off between additional forecast performance versus um, computational requirements. So that's a good question. Uh, just the last question from Kandrika. Um, he's asking about the importance of the off diagonals in the persistence matrix. Uh, even though the smoothing parameters in the diagonals are common. I need to get my math out to, to fully understand the question, but hopefully that makes sense. Can I see the question? Where is it? No. Uh, it's the yes. latest one from Kandrika. How important are the off diagonals, even though the smoothing parameters? I can provide some <laughs> insights I'm here. I'm trying to well. understand oh. what, yeah. So in our framework, we don't uh, look at the off diagonals. So that would correspond to smoothing parameters. Uh, for example, the level of first time series impacted by the error of the second time series. So this cross sectional effect, we don't uh, look at it in our paper. Uh, potentially that could be important. Uh, so that could be next steps in future research. So we, you know, in this paper, we just focused on a relatively basic, uh, easier to understand uh, vector exponential smoothing framework without any of diagonals. Cool. 
Uh, thanks, Ivan. Uh, I have a couple of practical questions. I'm kind of curious if you could give us a a sense of where you think like a practical benefit of using this method would be over uh, ETS. Are there any additional benefits to having it within this framework over just using universe uh, univariate ETS across all of our different series? Mm. Okay, so I think the practical problem with univariate models is that you know in, in this particular context if we don't have enough data histories then it's incredibly difficult to achieve good forecasting performance while a lot of businesses nowadays they have these natural groups in place they have that structure in place and therefore it is natural to look at them together um, and I think one beauty of the current PIC taxonomy is that it provides that flexibility. So in this paper, it is really what we try to uh, assess and examine is, you know, what actually helps uh, in terms of both point forecasts and the prediction intervals. So we look at parameters, initial values and components, and it turned out that yes, common smoothing parameters are very important, common initial values are very important, especially for seasonality, because otherwise you will have to estimate quite a lot of those initial states, but if they are common, then that become quite efficient, uh, especially if you believe that they have similar seasonal patterns. So these are insights coming out of this work. It's only, a, you, you know, we only just started it, it's the foundation. I think then, for the practitioners, then they can decide for their type of data, how to apply this, you know, what to turn on, what to turn off, give them that level of flexibility and a choice as well. And because of um, the package that Ivan has already written, I think that's quite helpful that it can be implemented uh, readily. Uh, while we still have some work to do, Ivan, yeah, in terms of model selection and grouping and so on that we've uh, talked about, then it will become even more user friendly if that can be incorporated into that overall framework. Okay, great. I'm going to have to check that out myself. Um, I haven't used that function in that package. Um, the only other thing was a bit more of a comment. Um, which I think is interesting. And I, I, I just want to say I enjoyed the, the long versus short comparison because I think in a post-pandemic world, this is actually quite a relevant, it's a, it's a very salient point around seasonal patterns have become distorted if we just pass in, you know, it's always an empirical question to me around how much historic data you want to feed in. Uh, different people have different opinions on that. But I think showing this kind of comparison is actually quite useful for that. Uh, particularly in this setting but that's more of a comment than a question <laughs> yeah I agree I, I get that co comment quite a lot and people are saying uh, yeah COVID has distorted quite a lot of things now so you, you have to be very careful how far back you, you look into the data history because at the moment all of the supply chains are all out of sorts out of sync um, so yeah uh, so again with the short data I, I think this is where the strength of the, the VETS models, PIC models coming in, because with short data, you can see very clearly uh, that it is beneficial. Right. I'm afraid that we have to finish now. And <laughs> I have people standing outside of the room and uh, waiting when I leave. Uh, so th thanks a lot, Huijing, for your presentation. Thanks a lot, Simon, for your comments. Uh, I've answered to some of those comments in the chat personally and thanks for coming sorry for technical issues and see you all in two weeks thank you very much thanks bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.